In this video, we're gonna cover what 99% of people miss when trying to build bulletproof hamstrings. I've done a lot of hamstring evaluations for clients and athletes over the past 10 years, and there are some consistent themes that I've noticed that a lot of people overlook. I've also learned a lot from mentors, and there's some new interesting research that just came out in 2024 that we're gonna cover. I've consolidated all of this into a four-step system to build strong, robust hamstrings. And step four is both the easiest, yet the most often neglected part. So by the end of this video, you'll understand each step that you need to take to really build bulletproof hamstrings. Let's go ahead and dive into it. Step number one is to stop stretching your tight hamstrings. That's because stretching doesn't fix tight hamstrings. Often the hamstrings feel tight, but they're actually lengthened, not shortened. For a long time, this really wasn't understood and everyone was just told to stretch their hamstrings even though it didn't really help and we knew that it didn't prevent injuries. Quite often, the reason that we feel the hamstrings are tight is because there's tension on the hamstrings. That actually comes from when the hips are dumped forward, pulling on the hamstrings to create tension, but that tension is from length not from tightness. This 2024 study shows us how pelvic position can make your hamstrings feel tight. And it shows us some mechanisms that a lot of coaches already understood. Anterior pelvic tilt is when our pelvis is dumped forward, which is a common postural presentation. Every five degrees of anterior pelvic tilt lengthens the hamstring by over one centimeter. This is particularly important at the upper hamstring where the majority of that length comes from. Here's why this is important for running. Think of it this way. Pretend your hamstring could handle 100 units of stress and sprinting provided 90 units of stress. Well, that's okay, you can handle it. But if you're starting in anterior pelvic tilt and you are already starting with 20 units of stress or tension, then that same 90 units of stress from sprinting will now cause an injury. This is a little bit oversimplified, but it's basically what's going on. I like to call it the strain before the strain. Okay. So what do you do about it? Instead of stretching, we have to change the position of the pelvis and the position that the hamstrings are in. This requires you to activate your hamstrings in a position that allows for control of pelvic tilt. I recommend starting with a wall 90-90 drill, slow and controlled, activating the hamstrings by trying to drag the feet down the wall. Gradually tilt the pelvis back and slowly exhale. I think a good starting point here is three times 30 seconds with that deep breathing and you can progress this to a single leg movement. If you're doing this right, you should feel a strong hamstring contraction, and as you're developing that neuromuscular control, you might even get some shaking. Learning to control pelvic position in conjunction with activating the hamstrings will help you make progress with building a strong, robust hamstring much faster than stretching. Now, step two is going to be to build up the hamstring tendons. We don't want to just build up the hamstring muscle, but we also want to build the tendon. This is based on some of the pioneering work of Thomas Gumatal on proximal hamstring tendinopathy. As a quick reminder, tendon is what connects the muscle to the bone, and typically we have some portion of degenerative tendon and some portion of healthy tendon. The protocol that I'm going to share involves holding a sustained muscle contraction so that the muscle can slowly shorten and we can get what's called stress relaxation or viscoelastic creep through the tendon. Basically that tendon slowly lengthening under stress. There's some good evidence that that slow lengthening process is helpful for rebuilding degenerative portions of tendon. But it's really important to know that not all hamstring exercises are created equally here. The way that we stress that tendon could provide more compression or could provide more strain depending on the length and the position of the hamstring. What I specifically recommend is 20 to 30 second hamstring bridges. And here's the exact progression that I like to follow. First would be a double leg flat glute bridge. This is just a typical glute bridge with your feet flat on the ground and the knees at about a 90 degree angle. Next would be a single leg glute bridge with the foot flat. I like to see good control here with the knees, hips, and shoulders in a straight line and no compensation with dropping the opposite hip. The next exercise on the continuum is a double leg long lever bridge. This is where you extend the knees out so that the knee is at an angle of around 150 degrees. It's important that the rib cage doesn't flare up and the lower back round in this position. Rather, we wanna exhale, have that rib cage down and still see that straight line between the shoulders, hips, and knees. Once that exercise is mastered, you can move on to a single leg long lever bridge. Same position. This is a really challenging exercise, but if you can get runners with proximal hamstring tendinopathy or athletes who have recurrent hamstring strains to be really strong and rock solid in this exercise, 
you tend to see really good outcomes. And then the most difficult variation on this continuum, which I try to get my athletes to, is this single leg bridge with the heel up on a box. We're gonna use a very slight bend in the knee here and focus on the position, maintaining that straight line between the knee, the hip, and the shoulder. I often like to test athletes starting at the easiest and letting them go up to the point where they can't go any farther on this progression. Once an athlete gets to an exercise where they can barely hold 20 seconds and can't quite hold 30 seconds in the proper position, you know that's a good exercise to prescribe to them in their program. So for you, that may be a single leg glute bridge or that may be a single leg long lever bridge. 20 to 30 seconds is enough time under tension to allow that muscle to slowly shorten and the tendon to slowly lengthen or creep, which is crucial for building stronger tendon properties. Now I know that these exercises are not designed to look cool on social media, like seated good mornings and Jefferson curls, but it is some of the most well-researched hamstring tendon training that top clinicians are using to reliably build up athletes' hamstrings and return them to high-level running. If you appreciate learning this progression and all the work that goes into making these videos, make sure you hit that like button. All right, now moving on to step number three, and that is to build max strength. A great test for this is the hip isometric push. If athletes can push into a force plate with a force in excess of two and a half times that that their body weight in the same position is producing, then that's a sign of really good hamstring strength. Okay, but what about for the 99% of people who don't have a force plate? You can still do this exercise with the exact same intention. The goal here is to drive the heel down hard into the ground and push the hips up. This long lever position is joint angle specific to running. It allows the athletes to build strength in a position that may be more useful than when you're building strength with deadlifts or Nordic hamstring curls. Hip hinges and other hamstring exercises are great, but there are a lot of athletes who can deadlift heavy and who are generally strong, but still struggle with recurrent hamstring issues. Often they don't know what to do. Testing quite often reveals that they lack hamstring in this long lever position and at this specific joint angle. This just happened with a high level strong athlete I evaluated this week, which is what prompted this video in the first place. When we build an athlete's strength in this long lever position from 520 newtons to 660 newtons, that can play a big role in finally getting them past this cycle of recurrent hamstring issues. So consider heavy long lever isometrics in your training program, I recommend three sets of three repetitions for four seconds with maximal force pushes. All right, and then step number four is consistent exposure to sprinting. Consistency is key when it comes to sprinting. When returning from a hamstring strain or when building up a robust hamstring, I recommend progressively increasing running speed. For example, running 10 times 10 yards slightly faster each day. This can start really slow after an injury. Maybe for 10 yards, you're running at 2.6 seconds. Try to hit exactly 2.6 seconds each rep 10 times. The next day, drop it to 2.5 seconds and then to 2.4 seconds. Listen to your body and gradually bring that speed up each session. If you're already pretty fast and feeling good, you might be starting out at 80 to 90% for week one or two when you're just starting and then pushing all the way to 100% for your 10 sets of sprints. Also, why 10 and why 10 yards? That's a good recommendation that's come from experts in the hamstring rehab space. And it also tends to be really good for your everyday athlete who benefits from the mechanics and the demands of sprinting, but doesn't want the risk of true top end speed. But if you're a healthy athlete and you need to be hitting true top end speed for your sport, then maybe you're going for longer distances. So your individual protocol may be eight by 40 yards. I don't know. But the important thing is the consistency and the gradual progressions. Another good way that I like to do this is to get on a curved treadmill and for one week, work on hitting 14 miles per hour five times. The next week, work on building up to 15 miles per hour five times. The next week, work up to 16 miles per hour five times. This is the same idea. We're delivering a consistent and progressive sprinting stimulus. This is so simple, yet it is so often overlooked. And I see so many athletes who have had a hamstring strain because they were inconsistent with their sprinting leading up to the time of injury. Just trust that your body will respond to this consistent stimulus and essentially learn that sprinting is safe. This fourth step really is essential because we can't have a real conversation about bulletproofing and only talk about slow movements or deep range of motion movements that happen to look cool on social media. We have to also be including consistent exposure to fast hamstring activations. Okay, so let's recap. Step one, stop stretching your hamstrings and instead learn to activate the hamstrings and control pelvic positions with drills like the 90-90 wall drill. Step two, 
build the hamstring tendons with longer duration isometrics like long lever bridge holds for three by 30 seconds. Step three, build max strength with something like the hip iso push for three sets of three repetitions, four seconds each. And then step four is consistent exposure to sprinting. That volume will be different to everybody, but maybe it's two to four times per week, and a good starting point might be 10 yards, 10 times, with the same time target, and having that time target progressively get faster each week. If you go through these steps, you'll be on track to have strong, robust hamstrings that can handle whatever you throw at them. If you guys do have any questions about the progressions that I laid out in this video, or how they would apply to you, feel free to leave a comment below and I'll do my best to get back to you. If you happen to be a coach who writes programs for athletes, then it might be beneficial for you to check out our full course program design 101. Not only does this earn you NSCA CEUs for maintaining your CSCS or your NSCA CPT certification, but it also teaches you step-by-step -step how to write great strength and conditioning programs for your clients and athletes. You'll see exact example programs and learn the principles of program design and then be provided with templates and instructions to write your own programs for your athletes step-by-step. -step. It's helped hundreds of coaches go from writing workouts to confidently writing strength and conditioning programs that deliver their athletes top results. I'll leave a link in the description below. Thanks so much for watching guys and we'll catch you in the next one.